In this video, we will explore the descriptive chemistry of some of the first row transition elements, common oxidation states, minerals, aqueous chemistry, and the ways you test for the various metal ions. The properties of the transition metals are very different from those of the main group metals. Some of the differences include the formation of multiple oxidation states, extensive coordination chemistry, and the formation of colored compounds. All of these properties arise from the transition metals having a partially filled set of d orbitals. So we're going to start out here talking about chromium. Chromium is the fourth member of the d block. Now chromium is one of your two exceptional electron configurations. You would think the configuration would be 4s2,3d4, but chromium borrows an electron out of the 4s to complete the half filling of the d block. So your electron configuration is really 4s1,3d5. The name for chromium comes from the Greek word chroma, meaning color. This is from the fact that chromium compounds are widely used as pigments. Chromium is widely used in electroplating. It exhibits a wide range of oxidation states from plus 2 up to plus 6, and the principal ore is chromite. FeCrO4. The lowest oxidation state for chromium is chromium 2. Now this is a D4 ion. We have to take out two electrons. One comes out of the 4s, the other one comes out of the 3d. That leaves you with the 4d electrons. This is formed when chromium metal is dissolved in dilute acid. It forms the hexaoco ion, which is sky blue in color, and this is an established oxidation state for chromium. Several compounds are known, the sulfate, the chloride, the hexacyanochromate, and this ion is easily oxidized to chromium-3. We'll see this over and over again as we go through the transition metals where you have multiple oxidation states. The lowest oxidation state is often easily oxidized to a higher oxidation state. Next is chromium-3, which is a D3 ion. We have to take out one more electron. Now this is a very stable oxidation state for chromium. It's kinetically inert meaning that it is slow to exchange ligands. As a result, different isomers can be isolated. Cis-trans, facial moridinal, optical isomers, and so forth. So as a result, chromium-3 compounds have been widely studied. There are several common examples of chromium-3 compounds. One example is potassium chromium sulfate dodecahydrate. This compound is known as chrome alum and is blue-green color in solution. Another example is chromium chloride hexahydrate, which is a green solid that dissolves up to give a green solution. In the solid state, this compound actually exists as multiple isomers, a chloro and a dichloro. It is the dichloro that is responsible for the green color. Another common chromium-3 compound is chromium-3 oxide, Cr2O3. This is a gray-green solid. It has been used as a green pigment called viridian. It is not soluble in water, but it is amphoteric. What this means is that it will react with both acids and bases. So chromium 3 oxide dissolves up in acid to produce the hexaoquine, 
and it dissolves in base to produce the tetrahydroxyide. The other common oxidation state is chromium-6. Now the best examples of chromium-6 include chromate and dichromate ions. So chromate is CrO4 2 minus. Chromate is yellow in color, and many of your heavy metal chromates are insoluble. So for example, lead chromate is insoluble. It has been used as a yellow pigment called chrome yellow. Barium chromate is also insoluble. And silver chromate is a brick red precipitate. Dichromate has the formula Cr2O7 2 minus. This ion is orange in color and it is widely used as an oxidizing agent. In contrast to chromates, all dichromates are soluble. Now, dichromate is a dimer of two chromates formed by sharing an oxygen atom. These two ions exist in equilibrium with one another. Adding acid converts chromate into dichromate. Conversely, adding base will remove the hydrogen ion from the left side and cause the equilibrium to shift to the left, back towards chromate. So adding base converts dichromate into chromate. So we move from chromium to manganese, the fifth member of the D block. The extra electron goes back into the 4S, so the electron configuration for manganese is 4s2, 3d5. Manganese is similar to iron, but harder and more brittle. Manganese improves the strength and toughness of steel, and so it is often alloyed with steel. Manganese exhibits a wide range of oxidation states, from plus 2 all the way up to plus seven. Some important minerals of manganese include rhodochrosite, which is manganese carbonate, and pyroluzite, which is manganese for oxide. The lowest common oxidation state of manganese is manganese two. Now, this is a D5 ion, which has important consequences for the chemistry of manganese 2. If you remember from crystal field theory, we have two possible electron configurations for a D5 ion. In the high spin form, we have placed one electron into each of the orbitals. In the low spin form, we have put them all into the lower energy T2G orbitals. What is important here is in the high spin form, the electron transitions are forbidden. One of your quantum mechanical selection rules says that you cannot change a spin state when you promote an electron. So therefore, the electron transitions are said to be spin forbidden. As a result, the colors of high spin manganese 2 compounds are very pale. For example, the hexa-aqua manganate ion is very pale pink in color, almost colorless. In fact, you would have to hold it against a white background to be able to tell that it's colored at all. The reason for this is that this is a high spin ion and electron transitions are not possible without the pairing of electrons. On the other hand, the hexacyano-manganate ion is blue in color, and that's because this is a low-spin ion, so the electron transitions can occur. Next is manganese-3. This is not a stable oxidation state for manganese. Some examples include MN2O3, which is manganese-3 oxide, and MN3O4, 
which contains both manganese 2 and manganese 3. Next is manganese 4. A common example is manganese 4 oxide, MnO2. This is a black insoluble solid and the bonding is generally considered to be ionic. Now this is a very common compound. For example, it is used as the oxidizing agent in certain types of batteries. Next is manganese 5. This is not a very common oxidation state and there are a few examples. One is the manganite ion which has the formula MnO4 3 minus. This ion is bright blue in color and it only exists in basic solutions. Next is manganese 6. This is not a common oxidation state and there are a few examples. One is the manganate ion which has the formula MnO4 2 minus. This ion is green in color. It's only stable as a solid or under basic conditions. And this can be made by treating potassium permanganate, KMnO4, with a mild reducing agent or by oxidizing manganese 4 oxide. So in other words, you can start with a higher oxidation state and reduce it down or you can start with a lower oxidation state and oxidize it. Last is manganese 7. This is a stable oxidation state for manganese. The most common example is potassium permanganate, KMnO4. Solutions are intensely purple in color, even dilute solutions and the solid is so intensely colored it's almost black. And this is widely used as an oxidizing agent. All right, I want to go through these one more time just so you can see them all on the same page. So oxidation state plus two, that's just the manganus ion. That's the one that's pale pink in solution as the hexa aqua ion. For plus four, we have manganese dioxide. That's the black insoluble solid ionic compound. For plus five, we have the manganite ion, which is blue. For plus six, we have the manganate ion, and that's green. And last, for plus seven, we have the permanganate ion, which is violet. Iron is the sixth member of the first row transition metals. As you would expect, the electron configuration of iron is 4s2, 3d6. Iron is one of the most abundant elements in the Earth's crust. What are some common minerals of iron? First is pyrite, which is FeS2 also known as fool's gold because of its golden appearance. With oxygen and sulfur being in the same group and both of them forming minus two ions, you might predict the oxidation state of the iron is plus four. That would not be correct. Whereas oxygen forms a peroxide ion, which is O2 two minus, Sulfur does something similar and forms the disulfide ion, S2, 2 minus. So the iron is in the plus 2 oxidation state and the sulfur is in the form of the disulfide ion. Second is hematite, Fe2O3, where iron is in the plus 3 oxidation state. Third, magnetite. Fe3O4, which is pictured on the slide. So if oxygen is minus 2, 4 oxygens will be minus 8, and 3 does not divide evenly into 8. So what is the oxidation state of the iron? 
The answer is that the iron is present in two oxidation states, plus two and plus three. Last is siderite, which is iron carbonate. If you know your polyatomic ions, you know that the charge on a carbonate is minus two, and so therefore the iron is in the plus two oxidation state. There are two common oxidation states of iron, plus two and plus three. Let's talk about the chemistry of iron two first. So iron two is a D6 ion, so the low spin form is diamagnetic. If you recall from crystal field theory, low spin complex ions are favored by strong field ligands. So iron two complexes with strong field ligands like cyanide are diamagnetic. Iron two is easily oxidized to iron three. It's also known as the ferrous ion. Most complexes are octahedral and your qualitative test for iron three is the formation of this trisphenanthraline complex ion with 110 phenanthraline. It's orange red in color and even dilute solutions of iron two will be colored. So a common complex ion of iron two is the hexacyanoferrate two ion. This goes by the common name of ferrocyanide. Potassium ferrocyanide is a very common compound. It's pale yellow in color but it is non-toxic despite the fact that it contains cyanide because the cyanide ions are very strongly bound. Because cyanide is a strong field ligand, this is a low spin complex ion and is therefore diamagnetic. When solutions of iron three and ferrocyanide ion are mixed, a blue precipitate known as Prussian blue is produced. So what's going on here? What compound is produced and how do we write the formula? Well note that a precipitate is produced and a precipitate cannot carry a charge. So therefore we have to write a formula that is electrically neutral. So the question becomes how do you write a formula between a plus three cation and a four minus anion? The only way to get a neutral formula is to have four of the plus three ion and three of the minus four ion. Prussian blue is used in blueprint paper and it's also used as a bluing agent in laundry detergent. Next we will go on to the chemistry of iron three. This is a D5 ion, so it cannot be diamagnetic regardless of whether it's high spin or low spin. This is also known as the ferric ion. The hexaquo ion is actually pale violet in color. However, this is hardly ever observed. In water, it actually forms the rust yellow hydroxy ion. So what's going on here and where is the hydroxide coming from? This is due to the high charge density of the iron three ion. The water molecules bind so strongly to the iron three that the OH bond is weakened and one of your hydrogens eventually pops off. This is where the hydroxide ion is coming from. And if you test the solution, you will find it to be acidic. There are many common examples of iron three complex ions. One is the ferrocyanide ion, which is ruby red and toxic because the cyanide is much more easily liberated than it is in ferrocyanide you need to be aware that there's two of these compounds, one for iron two and one for iron three. The ferrocyanide is the iron two compound 
and the ferrocyanide is the iron 3 compound. The qualitative test for iron 3 is the formation of a blood red complex ion with thiocyanate. In this picture you see a solution of iron 3 which is yellow in color. A couple of drops of dilute thiocyanate are added and the solution changes to a red color. Cobalt is the seventh member of the first row transition elements. As such the electron configuration of cobalt is 4s2,3d7. Cobalt is hard and brittle, similar in appearance to iron and nickel. You won't see many objects made out of pure cobalt metal, but you will see cobalt alloyed with other elements to make alloys with useful magnetic properties. Cobalt is generally unreactive. It will not react with hydrochloric acid, but it will react with concentrated nitric acid. So what's going on in this reaction? The cobalt metal is being oxidized and going into solution. That's what's turning the solution red. And the nitrate ion is being reduced down to nitrogen dioxide gas. That is the brown gas that you see coming off. Cobalt has two common oxidation states, plus 2 and plus 3. Let's talk about cobalt 2 first. This is a D7 ion, so both the high spin and the low spin forms are paramagnetic. It is fairly easily oxidized to cobalt 3. It's known as the cobalt us ion in the old style nomenclature system. And complexes can be octahedral or tetrahedral. For example, anytime a cobalt 2 salt is dissolved up in water, the hexa aqua ion is produced, which has octahedral geometry and is pale pink in color. When hydrochloric acid is added, the tetrachloral cobaltate ion is formed, which has tetrahedral geometry and is blue in color. And if an excess of thiocyanate is added, the tetrahedral thiocyanato ion is formed, which is violet. Cobalt 2 oxide has been used to color glass, hence the term cobalt blue. Next is cobalt 3. This is a D6 ion, so low spin complexes will be diamagnetic. Low spin complexes are favored by strong field ligands, so cobalt 3 complexes with strong field ligands will be diamagnetic. Cobalt 3 complexes are also inert, meaning that they do not exchange ligands readily. As a consequence of this, different isomers can be isolated, cis-trans, spatial meridional, and so forth. So as a result, cobalt-3 complexes have been widely studied. A reasonable question would be, if cobalt-3 compounds are inert and do not exchange ligands readily, then how do you make a cobalt-3 compound? The typical synthetic procedure is to start with a cobalt-2 salt and oxidize it to cobalt-3 in the presence of the desired ligands. Oxidation can be achieved with an oxidizing agent such as hydrogen peroxide or simply by drawing air through the solution, in which case atmospheric oxygen achieves your oxidation. For example, oxidation of cobalt chloride hexahydrate with three equivalents of ethylene diamine produces the orange-red tris-ethylene diamine compound. Oxidation of cobalt chloride hexahydrate with 
two equivalents of ethylene diamine produces the green trans form of the bis ethylene diamine compound. This is readily converted to the cis form, which is blue, simply by heating and water. Sometimes even traces of moisture can achieve the conversion of the green trans form into the blue cis form. Nickel is the eighth member of the first row transition elements. As such, the electron configuration of nickel is 4s2, 3d8. Nickel is silvery white in appearance. It is a fair conductor of heat and electricity. It does not tarnish or react with air. And so as a consequence, nickel plating is sometimes used to protect iron. Last, nickel is often a component of alloys with useful magnetic properties. There is only one common oxidation state of nickel, and that is nickel-2. Complexes of nickel-2 can be octahedral, tetrahedral, or even square planar, the latter case being with strong field ligands such as cyanide. Nickel is the only member of the first transition series to form any square planar complexes. Anytime nickel-2 salts are dissolved up in water, the green hexa-aqua ion is produced. Addition of concentrated ammonia results in formation of the violet hexamine compound. And if ethylene diamine is added, the tris ethylene diamine ion is produced. Nickel produces a pink precipitate with dimethyl glycine, abbreviated DMG. This is a minus one ion, so that when two of these coordinate, the charge on the ligands balances the charge on the metal, and the compound precipitates out. This serves as a qualitative as well as a quantitative test for nickel. A qualitative test is determining which ions are present in solution. A quantitative test is determining how much of the ion is present in solution. So you could conceivably recover the nickel DMG precipitate, obtain the mass of the precipitate, and in this way determine how much nickel was in the solution. Copper is the ninth member of the D-block elements. As such, you would expect the electron configuration to be 4s2, 3d9, but copper is one of your two exceptions. It borrows an electron out of the 4s to complete the filling of the d-block, so your actual electron configuration is 4s1, 3d10. There are several common ores of copper. First is cuprite, which is copper oxide, Chalcosite is copper sulfide, and chalcopyrite is copper iron sulfide. Now the reduction potential of copper is positive, so reducing down copper 2 to copper metal is positive 0.34 volts. When you reverse a reaction, you change the sign. So the reverse reaction, which would be the oxidation of copper metal to copper 2, would be negative 0.34 volts, which would be unfavorable. Stated another way, copper would rather be copper metal than copper 2 plus ion. It's unreactive. This is why things like plumbing pipe are made out of copper metal. It's also why copper can be found in nature in elemental form. Copper does not react with concentrated hydrochloric acid. It will react with concentrated nitric acid. So what's going on in this reaction? The copper is being oxidized to copper 2 ion, which is what's turning the solution greenish colored, 
and the nitrate ion is being reduced down to nitrogen dioxide gas. That is the brown gas that's coming off. There are two common oxidation states of copper, plus two and plus one. Let's talk about copper two first because it is the more common. So copper two has a D9 configuration. Some common copper compounds include copper sulfate pentahydrate, which is known as blue vitriol. It's definitely blue in color and copper chloride dihydrate, which is more blue-green in color. Most copper compounds are some shade of blue or green. In aqueous solution, copper two forms the pale blue hexaalkyl ion. The geometry of this compound is distorted octahedral. Two of the bonds are definitely longer than the other four. This is called Jean Teller distortion, and it's a consequence of the D9 configuration. The color is pale because the center of the absorption lies in the infrared region of the spectrum. For a compound to be colored, it has to be absorbing in the visible region. Here, the center of the absorption is actually in the infrared with only a portion of the absorption trailing into the visible region. When 15 molar ammonia is added to the solution, the water molecules exchange for ammonia molecules. However, it is not the hexamine that's produced. Copper hangs on to two of the water molecules and it is actually a tetramine that's produced. The color changes to a darker blue and the color becomes more intense. This is because the center of the absorption is shifted into the visible. If you look at your spectrochemical series, ammonia lies ahead of water. So therefore we are shifting the absorption from something that's centered in the infrared to something that is centered in the visible. Addition of ethylene diamine forms the bis ethylene diamine. So as was the case with the ammonia compound, copper hangs on to two of the water molecules. Now let's talk about the chemistry of copper one. This is a D10 ion, which means all the electrons are paired, so it is diamagnetic. This is the less stable of the two oxidation states. It's fairly easily oxidized to copper two, so that any work must be done in an inert atmosphere. Even exposure to air will cause oxidation of copper one to copper two and most compounds are white or colorless. This is a consequence of the D10 configuration. The colors of transition metal compounds arise from electrons moving between orbitals. These electron transitions are not possible in a D10 ion because the orbitals are completely filled. So copper chloride, copper bromide, Copper iodide are all white in color. Copper oxide, which is cuprite, is red in color, but the color is not due to DD transitions, but rather to charge transfer. And last, for copper one complex ions, the most common geometry is tetrahedral. So last, we get to zinc, the 10th member of the transition series. As you would expect, the electron configuration of zinc is 4s2, 3d10. In many ways, zinc is more like an alkaline earth metal than a transition metal. First is the formation of a single oxidation state. Zinc only does the plus two ion. It does not exhibit multiple oxidation states. Second, all compounds are white or colorless. 
Both of these are a consequence of the D10 configuration. When zinc loses two electrons to form the plus two ion, they come out of the 4s orbital. Loss of a third electron would disrupt a filled shell. Also, because the D block is completely filled, DD transitions are not possible. Zinc is easily oxidized. It will react with even dilute hydrochloric acid. It is often used as the anode in batteries. And if you recall, the definition of anode is the site of oxidation. Galvanized objects are often coated with zinc to prevent the oxidation of the underlying metal. The idea being that the zinc will oxidize before the underlying metal does. And last, it is the lowest melting of the first row transition elements. Some common minerals of zinc include sphalerite and wurtzite, which are forms of zinc sulfide. Smithsonite is zinc carbonate. Zinc oxide is used as a white pigment in pates and in some antiseptic ointments. Last, let's talk about the aqueous chemistry of zinc too. Complexes can be octahedral or tetrahedral. For example, the hexaaqua ion is formed in aqueous solution, which obviously has octahedral geometry. In dilute hydroxide, zinc hydroxide precipitates. However, in excess hydroxide, the tetrahydroxy zincate ion is produced, which obviously has tetrahedral geometry. Similar complex ions are produced with ammonia. In this case, the tetraamine zinc-2 ion is produced, which is also tetrahedral.